with a blessing. Thank you, Josh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, our announcements this week, we don't have anything new necessarily, except for uh, uh, December 26th worship, which Pastor Brian will share with us later. Um, but they're all here for the so thank you for your support.
thank you all. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, the God of family is sharing our Advent moment with us as we got the third candle, the candle of joy.
Have you ever had Colombian coffee before? Raise your hand. You've had Colombian coffee before. Our people grow coffee. They're coffee farmers. And, uh, they also grow guineo or bananas. They like their bananas and lots of other <coughs> micro farms that they have because they really like to take care of nature. You'll see they wear white robes there. White robes, that's a sign of purity that they have. This is a whole group of ladies in a village high up in the mountains that I was able to, to make it to, uh, thankfully. And they, they live in huts like you see. They live off the grid. Their running water is the river. And their light bulb is the sun and the moon. And uh, they like it that way. They like to take, take care of nature and keep things the way they are. You see, uh, down here in the States or even in Colombia, below the mountains, uh, when we develop things, we call that great, that we have initiative and we're developing things, and they call that destruction. So our development is to them destruction. So they try to keep things the same because they're trying to establish equilibrium. Well, you see, the thing with equilibrium is always like a teeter-totter, right? Back and forth, we're always out of balance, but we have to try to get back into balance. Um, these people are Native Americans of Colombia. So they, we call them indigenous people. That's how they refer to themselves. Here in the States, we have Native Americans. They live on reservations all the time. Similar in Colombia. These are the native people of Colombia. Before colonization, 500 years ago, their ancestors were there, the Tyrona people group. And now we have four people groups in this mountain range, and uh, three of them are unreached. And when I say that, that means that there's uh, there's a handful of believers per people group, but there's maybe one or two churches that we know about. But for the most part, many of them do not know a Christian. Some of the Christians that are there uh, are secret about their faith because there's persecution. If somebody wanted to hear the gospel, they couldn't hear it in their language because they have their own language, not Spanish, but their own language. These are people that someone has to be sent so that they can hear Paul talk about that, right? In Romans. How will they hear unless it's preached to them about Jesus, about the gospel? How will they call on his name unless they hear it? How will they hear it unless it's preached? And how will it be preached unless they are sent? That's what Southern Baptists do collectively. And it's a joy to be a Southern Baptist missionary because we're in this mission together. And we're, we're the ones sent out to tell them. We come alongside of Colombian churches so that they can be sent to preach the gospel to people that haven't heard about the good news of Jesus. You see, I've got a mochila on. Can you say mochila? Mochila. And so this mochila, let's tell something else about our people group. The ladies make these. They're all the time selling a, a mochila. If they're walking, there's a mochila. They sit for a medical appointment. Mochila talking with the lady. Mochila. Uh, I'm you, it's made out of sheep wool. They are sheep herders. Each color you see is a different color sheep that, that they have. So they shave them, buy the wool, they just shave the wool, and then if you want a black color, you just take the black wool and you make it into twine and then you to hair or sew the rest of it or knit the rest of it together. All the men, all the women have a cheetah, at least one, sometimes three or four, depending on how long your trip is. Like I said, they, they really love nature. And, but the sad part about the Arapahoe, the Weewa, the Tokyo, yeah. this mountain range in Colombia, the northern part of Colombia, is that they worship nature. Well, how they yeah, well, they're afraid of nature because you see in their ancient narratives. We have ancient narratives too. You know, Genesis 1, 2, 3, those ancient narratives. This forms our Christian worldview. This is the, the truth. This is the real narrative of how the world was created. The creator of God, right? Made it. And so, but their ancient narratives tell a different story. That before the sun rose, before the first day of first sun rose, there were people walking around in the garden. And when the sun rose, all those people became the hands of objects. The trees, the rocks, the river, the laguna, right? And so, all uh, now, since they became those objects, though, they are the guardians or the um, owner of those things. So if you want to use a rock and what they call destruction, you use a rock to make a husband, you have to ask permission from the owner first. And you're going to create a lack of balance 
in the universe or in nature. And when you do that, if you have a lack of balance and bad things happen to you, earthquakes and tornadoes, sickness in your village, death. And so you don't want that. So you try to reestablish equilibrium. So here's what they do. Reestablish. A payment must be made to the owner of the rock if you move a rock. And so they take a piece of pot and they crouch down and they meditate. They put their negative thought and negative energy of things into this piece of pot. And that that act that they did, they moved the rock and they asked the to make a change. They put it in the pot, and they put it in the and they go on a journey to the owner of the rock where he lives, or the Laguna, and they go there, and they offer that piece of cotton as a payment to reestablish equilibrium. You see, our world does lack balance and equilibrium, but what our world needs is not reestablishing something that's teetering on that. Our world needs peace. Peace is something we celebrate at Christmas time. Jesus came, Prince of Peace. You see, while they offer this payment to the owner of something to reestablish equilibrium, Jesus came and he put our sins on himself. And he offered himself as a payment for all sins for those who believe in him to the owner of everything to, re to establish peace. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the gospel for us. That's the gospel for the indigenous in the north part of Colombia. They call the owner of everything the we power in their language. The Christians have developed this compound word that they said, well, what will I call God? Because we're polytheistic. We believe in many gods. And so we can choose one of them. And so they wrestled with this and they said, well, we believe in there's a, well, our people believe there's an owner of everything, but who's the owner? There's an owner of each individual thing, but who's the owner of everything? So that compound word means the owner of everything, Niwi power. That's how they, the Christians refer to God. Niwi power, the owner of everything because he created everything and he deserves all glory from our people group and from their people group and from all of his creation. Amen. Well, what's our vision in Colombia? Well, we want to see churches planted among these people groups. We want to see the local body of Christ that speaks the language of the people, that understands the gospel in their language, can explain it to others that have testimonies from living out of salt and light in their community that they can share with others. We want them to shine brightly in their communities as they live righteous lives together as the body of Christ. We want them to disciple their own children using their, their language so they understand the gospel in their own language. We want to see a, a church in each community. So how do we go about that? Well, we meet people where they're at. If, if they haven't heard the gospel, then we do evangelism. We tell, tell them about Christ. So we use Bible stories to do that. And so uh, many of them don't read Especially their own language. It's not a written language. It's a verbal language. It's oral language. So we try to use Bible stories so that they can easily share that same story with others. They don't have to know how to read. If I tell them the story orally, we're faithful to the Word of God, and then they can remember the story and tell it to other people. If they're young Christians, we disciple them. We walk alongside of them. Some of them live in our city where we live, so we can walk alongside them there in Christian life, and some of them live in Foothills County where we can meet up with them as well, where they do training, and some of them live there where, where they go to market. And some of them live on the reservations, and a few times we've had the privilege of being able to go on a reservation, meet around a fire, and share Bible stories and our testimony around that fire, and ask who wants to follow Jesus. Repent of your sins and follow Jesus. You see, they wear those white robes, and we have a vision that was from the Apostle John in Revelation 7 and 9 says that all peoples will be represented around the throne of God, including the outer walkers, and they will be wearing a robe of white, and they will be pure, but not from their own rituals, but from the blood of Jesus, as we will be wearing white with them, right, around the throne of God. Oh, I look forward to being there around the throne of God with you. Some man, some idol waffles, some Malagasy, from that gets covered. All in white, washed by the blood of Jesus. Praising God together. So he has established peace. You see, you might think, wow, these people are so different than us. Back to what we see. Um, 
Turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. These people are just after balance in life. And they're just, they're at a, a futile attempt at balance in life. You know, we share that futile attempt. Our world shares that futile attempt at balance. It's not just the thing that the Ottawa's are on that journey, but we are as well. And what we truly need is peace. Peace by Christ. So Colossians chapter 1. Chapter, Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 22. Verses 19 through 22. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. See, many of many people are on this futile attempt at balance with God. And they think they can do it. They're, they can merit salvation or they think that they can work it right. They, if I just be good, I'll be good enough that I can go to heaven. I'll be good enough. I'm, I'm good with the big thing, right? You've heard that before? I've heard it. I'm good with, I'm good with the big thing. Um, and they think they can work out that balance. We see the thing is that we're all sinners. And we need the peace that Jesus brings by the, He made it by the blood of His cross. Jesus wants to reconcile all things to Himself. He's going to reconcile all things to Himself, including us. Including us. He can reconcile us to God. A futile attempt looks like trying to, to get to God and be good with God without Christ. That's a futile attempt to balance with God. What you need is peace made by the blood of Jesus Christ. cross. Or maybe you think, oh, I'll try to balance within. And when I, uh, maybe if I just want to watch one more Netflix show, maybe one more show, I'll feel better. Right? Or uh, maybe if I get everything on my Christmas list, I'll feel better. Or when I get that job promotion, or when I have that child, or when I'm an empty nester, then I'll have balance. Or when I retire, then I'll have balance. I'll feel good then. I'll have balance then. You see, Jesus reconciling all things to himself. He makes peace by the blood of his cross. He makes peace within you. Peace with God. Peace within you. That no matter what stage of life you're in or situation you find yourself or what you get at Christmas, right? You can have peace by the blood of Jesus cross. Peace within. Peace knowing whose you are. God's son or daughter. In Christ. Or peace with fellow man. You see, there's kind of four relationships that he can reconcile with God, with you, within you, with yourself, with, with fellow man, and with nature. With peace with fellow man, I, I have a story. I shared this morning with the youth and the young adults there at Sunday school. A story of reconciliation in my own testimony. I believe that he can reconcile relationships, and I've seen him reconcile relationships with me and my family. And he can reconcile relationships with you. You need not just balance in your relationships with people or just kind of keeping balance, but you need peace, transformation in your relationships. If you harbor bitterness or there's unforgiveness in relationships, you can offer that same forgiveness that God gives you to others. And you watch Jesus reconcile your relationship. He'll be at the center of it. He offers you peace with fellow man. And then he offers you peace with creation. The Ottawa's are really uh, restless about peace with, with nature, with creation. He offers peace with it because he's he offers peace with nature because he's reconciling all things to himself. We don't have to be afraid of nature. We don't have to think I gotta get all I can get from nature either. We don't have to be preppers because of things happening in nature. But we can groan with creation for the redemption of man. For the reconciliation of all things, for the restoration of all things, we can groan eagerly await heaven within the peace instead of in fear. So that message is for us, a peace by the blood of Jesus' cross. We need peace just like the Ottawa was, but we want the Pope, need peace as well. 
in the northern part of Columbia. If that message is for you this morning, then after the service, please come down and, and talk with Pastor Frank or me or other deacons about being reconciled to God, finding reconciliation in those other relationships we spoke about, being reconciled to God. That's my plea to you today. Now let's turn to Psalm 67. That was kind of our message to the Audible, the message to us about peace, a little cultural introduction. Now let's turn to Psalm 67. This might, Psalm 67. This might be our the, the message for us. Psalm 67. We're going to stand together and read God's word together. going to be on the screen there, so you can look up the wall read from the same uh, translation. Okay. Let's read Psalm 67 together. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make His face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded an increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Thank you, Nancy. This is a Thanksgiving song from what we can tell. Uh, you can see in verse 6 there, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. The psalm of, of Israel. Israel was meant to be a light to the nations. Similar to Christ's church, a light, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. A light to the nations. They're saying, God bless us. And there's a purpose behind your blessing. I want us to see that this morning. There's a purpose behind God's blessing on our lives. Have you been blessed? Amen. In Colombia, oh wow. Uh, we went to Mexico to learn language. And you heard Dios te bendiga sometimes. God bless you. But in Colombia, oh, it's the big thing. You say, bendiciones, blessings, blessings to everybody. You have to greet everyone with bendiciones in Colombia. Taxi drivers, bendiciones. And uh, at church, bendiciones. And your neighbors in the morning, bendiciones. Just everybody gets blessings. Blessings, blessings, blessings. There's a lot of talk about it. You know, God has a purpose behind blessings. We have been blessed. His face does shine on us as His church. So God, in grace, He does and bless us, make His face shine upon us. And then here's our purpose behind God's blessing. Israelites were realizing that purpose and remembering the purpose as they sung this song. I pray that we'll sing this song. God, bless us, be gracious to us, make Your face shine on us, that Your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. The purpose behind our blessing is that His way and His salvation be known among the nations. Amen. 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 You, you see, I want our hearts to say, I want my heart to say, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. <coughs> See in verse 4, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Sometimes we have the wrong view of God and the nations. We think, well, each nation's got their own God and their own thing. Shall I'm glad the God of the Arabophiles and things. You see right here, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and you guide the nations upon earth. You see, God's not just our God, the God of the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not just the God uh, that sends rain on all the people. He's the God that reigns over all people. Amen. He's the God that sent Jesus, the Savior of the world. This Jesus that looked on, uh, on at Pontius Pilate. And he said, you wouldn't have any authority. It wasn't given to you by my father. Yeah. God's the God of all nations. He is judge of all nations. He is God of all nations. And if we don't believe that, we believe kind of this 
big word for all known for using big words this morning. So universalism, right? Where everybody's got their own path to God. You do you, you heard you do you, that's a new thing, right? Or maybe it's an old thing, but I'm new to the stage. You know, it's been a while since I've been around. You do you, uh, to each his own. Just everybody's got their own way to go to God. It's just not true. It's just not true. And it kills this uh, fervor for missions. When we believe that everybody's got their own way, the people are in desperate need and hopeless without Jesus. And God deserves glory from all peoples. That's the biblical truth. That's the reality. We, we best put our hearts in line with God's, God's word and our feet to God's mission. I want to show you some examples of people that I've seen in Colombia now that are leveraging the blessing of God in their life for the glory of God among these unreached people groups in Mount South Carolina. Okay, so let's see some testimonies now. This next photo is going to be of a, a sister in Christ. She lives in a foothills town in Colombia. She's a member of a local church there. And um, she has an indigenous background, not from this people group. Can we show her her picture, brother? Uh, there we are, there we are. So during the pandemic, during COVID, we were all on lockdown. Colombia took it real serious. I know America took it really serious too. Just different, different ways of taking it serious. Lockdown, you stay in your house. You couldn't go out but once every five days to go to the grocery store or the bank if you needed to. And they checked your uh, ID for the last two numbers, for the last number of your ID, only two numbers a day. You could go out every fifth day. You could go. So we were on lockdown. We couldn't leave our city even on the day we could go out. And so the uh, Ermana, the sister there, she couldn't leave her foot to the town come down to the city. Well, a baby up in the mountains got burned. Uh, burned their hand. That's a problem that happens because they have fires down low. The babies are wandering around and crawling and stuff. And so sometimes that unfortunately happens. So it got burned. They needed some cream for the baby's hand because she's in contact with all these indigenous, uh, several indigenous tribes and people up in the mountains a, a little bit uh, higher elevation from her. Now, she journeys up there, goes up there, and she uh, prays for them and shares her testimony with them or, or shares the Bible story with them. Sometimes when they come into town, she receives them in her home for coffee or bread. Um, or sometimes they've stayed with her. I think this young man, actually, the uncle of the baby, he lived with her and her family for um, a year or two. I think he went and did studies. So she opens her home. And she uses her nationality and where she lives. And in fact, she lives close to these people. She goes up there. She's leveraging these blessings of God that she has for the glory of God among these people. So I was able to meet them, her son, at the, the border of our county. Before we took across the gate, there was a gate there, and we uh, passed the cream. She couldn't come get the cream, but I, I couldn't get up there and give her the cream, so we met there at the middle. Uh, that was my one time out of town in five months. It was great. It was just nice to see something other than the city. In the um, so she, that's just one way uh, somebody I've seen in Columbia using there the blessing of God and realizing that there's a purpose behind it. That uh, God's way may be known on earth, His saving power in Jesus would be known among all nations. This next photo is going to be of uh, me and Leah and our God even faith. And you're like, well, that's interesting. I'm so thankful for our dining room table. That's the Lottie Moon dining room ta table right there. It was Lottie Moon table. Okay? So thank you for giving the Lottie Moon. You, know, you put the food on that table and the, and the table itself. And, and that, for that matter, you pay the rent of the house that it's in because that's the Lottie Moon house, I guess you could say, because that's what pays the rent of our house. We invite people around our dining room table. They have a meal, and I would just be so surprised because people are honest around our dining room table. More honest than they are when we visit them in their home. And I think the reason for that is because there's persecution, and they may feel awkward or weird or, or scared to share their questions or their faith at their home. But around our dining room table is a safe place. We've had such honest conversations and good conversations. Hours on end sometimes of sharing about their uh, their their background or about their people group. We've learned so much about their culture because of dining room table conversations that end in prayer often for all the lost people that they know or for their family or for themselves. As many of them sat around our table have been, have been Christians themselves. And one of the ladies even in this photo, I had to blur out her face for security reasons, but one of the ladies even in that photo has given her life to the Lord. And now we're praying with her and teaching her more about baptism. 
praying that the Lord will lead towards that and give them boldness to be baptized. Because it means something real significant to them. Because it could bring persecution. But I think it could bring a lot of joy in a believer's life to identify with Christ and his, his death and his resurrection and new life in Christ. We want her to be baptized because we want to have that joy that we have in that moment of activation. The, the next photo there is going to be of a Zoom class. So during COVID also, we couldn't meet in the churches. The churches were closed for uh, nine to ten months, I believe, in Colombia. And so this church, we planned with them to plan out a, uh, a missions class. Missions 101, we were going to call it, there. And... So they can learn more about the indigenous people, learn more about unreached peoples. It's not part of any church's DNA to have a kind of a mission team or a missions person or the, for the church to pray for mission efforts to equip the young people and raise them up to send them out as missionaries or on mission. In fact, many of these people have never even talked to an indigenous person, even though they, they have seen many. They've never talked to them, had a conversation with them. We were able to get some of the indigenous folks on the call one night that have been living up with those towns, so they could talk with them, and some of them were in tears hearing their Christian testimony. They said, I didn't even know there were Christians, or that there would be Christians among the indigenous. And they're just uh, in awe of how God's working among them. So we did uh, 11 weeks uh, of, of this missions class. That was a big growth moment for me because I was having to learn how to talk about all, this th all these things in Spanish. And so we'd write the class, and we'd do the class on and I can say there's some fruit from it. Many of them have, have begun to pray for these unreached people that are in their backyard just an hour and a half out of the city. They can reach them or they even see some of them in the city. Uh, one of the young ladies has gotten involved and she's come out and helped us do some children's ministry in a foothills town with the displaced indigenous people. And I read just this morning, and I just rejoice. They're taking up a collection at their church this Christmas of toys for unreached indigenous people. My knowledge, that was not on their radar a year or two ago. And now the Lord is moving in them. They want to be a part of God's mission among these lost people. They're growing in zealousness for God's glory and brokenness for lost people. That's what we want to do as well. I saw them leverage some of the blessings in their life of their extra time they had here in COVID. They got on this call and they wanted to learn. They just wanted to learn how to pray more than anything. How can we get involved? How can we pray? You can do that too. Use your time and leverage this blessing that you have to learn about unreached people. You can learn about our unreached people on YouTube and Wikipedia if you want to. There's ways to learn. There's National Geographic articles about them. There's ways you can learn and learn how to pray. You can follow us uh, on Facebook or on email and get updates on how you can pray for our unreached people. You can, uh, you can leverage this connection now that you have in order to, to pray for them. This next slide is a Mountain Community Church. This is a Colombian church. In our area, there's well over 200 churches. You're like, why are there missionaries there? Because there's like two churches in the whole mountain range of indigenous people. It's a cross-cultural work. So this church, live, they, they live, they're uh, farmers, coffee farmers, same types of farmers as indigenous, but they're not indigenous. They live high up in the mountains there. Forty years that church has been there, and they've never reached out to the indigenous people. Generations of Christians living right there, they're the neighbors, their farms are literally the, the farms next to the indigenous reservation. They don't reach out to the indigenous people. Why? Well, because they're different from them. Remember development and destruction? They kind of have political wars as well. They don't align politically. They fight There's some prejudice that's grown over the years. Uh, generations have passed it on. But just a few months, it seems, before I met the pastor of this church, the Lord had laid on his heart that they want they should reach the indigenous people. And cross that cultural divide in Jesus' name to love them and tell them the gospel. And offer them the hope that they have in Jesus. And then I ended up meeting this brother because I was looking for connections out there. And he said, it's interesting that I met you providentially even because God's been working on my heart that we should do this. So we invited me up to this community. We did a mobilization class of teaching them about missions and uh, one strategic way that they can reach them doing Bible story. 
And they were really excited how the next date on the on the calendar for March of 2020, you know what happened then, right? And so I haven't been back to this community. They don't even have cell phone reception. So it kind of is sad to me. I'm looking forward to getting back to Columbia. So I go visit this community and we'll start walking again with them in this mission that the Lord has for them. We don't have to do this mission alone. You see, now they're going to leverage the blessing of God in their life, of where they live, the people they know, for the mission of God. This next photo is of some, uh, the, I'm the man in the funny hat, but then everybody else is Cuban. And we met up in Columbia. You say, how's that? Well, with the IMB, one thing that's neat that's happening is something you can pray about. For us as a mission board, a Southern Baptist mission board, we're trying to walk alongside some um, some other Baptist conventions in other countries and help them form mission agencies where they can send out their own missionaries. And so one of the Baptist conventions that we worked with as a mission board is in, in Cuba. And now Cuba has already sent out several missionaries. They've come, several of them have come to Colombia to join our mission team. Our mission team these days is more Latino than it is North America. And I praise God for that. Because now we've got a young lady from the Dominican Republic sent out from a church there that's on our team. And two Cuban families on our team. And just two North American families. So I praise God for that. Our team meetings, we're starting to talk in Spanish these days. It's great. But these Cubans, they're not just, just any, any old person. These were medical doctors. They've moved and left their life there and their professions there. Now they're using medicine and their doctor background to get high up in the mountains and do medical projects there. You can pray about their medicine. It's just starting now. They're making the um, connections with the communities and asking permission if they can do those uh, medical clinics there and share the gospel there is the ultimate reason and, and call out for <coughs> salvation in Christ being reconciled. One of them is a, uh, was a professor of music at a university in Cuba. Now he's using his background in music to help indigenous people write music in their own language to praise God and glorify their creator. New music that doesn't exist. Amen. This last picture I've got for a testimony to share with you is of Oscar. Oscar's his pseudonym. We make up a name for Oscar to protect him um, from further persecution. Oscar was, uh, he's an Arawaku man. When he was born, his parents and the uh, religious leader said he's going to be a religious leader when he grows up. They prophesied over him in their cultural way. Well, they were right, just wrong also. Because God had plans to save Oscar by Christ. And he got introduced to the gospel as a teenager. And now he's, he's saved and now he is a missionary to his own people. So he is a religious leader among his people. He's a missionary among his people. And Oscar wanted to plant a church on his farm. And they had a small group of people coming together, but he needed a, a good way of coming together that was kind of under the radar. If everybody just came to his farm once a week or every other week to meet together, people were catching on. So he said, well, what can I do? And we were like, Oscar, how can we help you? Because we've been walking with Oscar in discipleship and leadership development because he, he's going to be a leader. He is a leader, a Christian leader in, among his people. So we came up with this idea to start a pig farm on Oscar's farm. We got the money, we gave it to Oscar as a loan, a VBS of kids here in the states of South Carolina, a church down there, gave some money to give the piglets to Oscar to get started. And I thought they were going to raise enough for like one or two piglets, and they gave him 25 piglets. It was awesome. So Oscar's been blessed. Now he's got to leverage his blessing of God for the glory of God among his people. And so... That's what he's doing. They're meeting there. They built the pig farm. It's still getting going. They bought several piglets, and now they're trying to raise them up. So the next step is they can sell a piglet. They're hoping to fund missionary efforts through the selling of the piglet, bless families in need within their church community, and also have a good way of coming together. So we're just going to work on Oscar's pig farm. He's slaughtering a pig. They're going to have a pig pig in this weekend. A pig pig in this weekend. We're going. You know, that's the reason we're going. And uh, y'all got that joke, right? Pig pig. We're in North Carolina. <laughs> okay. okay. But I just, oh, I just love walking with Oscar in this. He prayed for Oscar and his wife, Holly. Um, they're first generation Christians. They don't know what it means to be a Christian parent because they've never seen a model of it. So pray for Oscar and his wife, Holly. 
that they would uh, continue to grow in righteousness and in knowledge of God, and that they would teach their child that in their rising up and in their laying down, when they're cooking and cleaning, while they're hiking, all areas of their life, like Deuteronomy 6 says, teach them to love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength to their sons, the good, godly Christian. So these people leverage the blessing of God for the mission of God in their lives. What about you? How can you uh, be a part of God's mission? As I am, we've got this tagline I'm going to put up on the screen. Every church, every nation. I just love that. That really is our, our heart. We want to all be in this mission of God together. Every church can be a part of reaching every nation for Christ. Your church can reach the world and you have a part to play. We need you to be a vital part of our missionary team overseas. Our goal should be that every member is somehow engaged in God's mission, both locally and globally. And so one of the main ways we do that at Southern Baptist is from the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So that's our next slide there. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering, you've been probably talking about that. I saw some brochures out and some, uh, some posters out about the Lottie Moon Christmas I want to tell you this morning a little bit about how we've seen that being used in our life. I already spoke about our dining table in our house. And I want to say thank you for giving to that. So for our truck, it's a 4x4 four four truck, and I'm thankful for that. It's our Lottie Moon truck. There's many times we need that 4x4 four four because we get into muddy roads, but we didn't know we are going to be muddy roads. And so thank you for our Lottie Moon truck that helps us get to villages and get to um, foothills, towns, and the mountains. Thank you for our medical care. Uh, this past term in Bogota, we had our little boy with you. And he was born there. He's two now. Why did Christmas all pay for our medical care in Bogota? We didn't have to come back to the States to have the baby. We didn't have the baby there in Colombia, and now he's a Colombian citizen as well as with dual nationality. We praise God for that. How is God going to use his dual nationality? But I think Southern Baptist that we were able to have him there, and, uh, and that he's now. A Colombian citizen as well. For our airline tickets, uh, in just about two and a half, three weeks, we'll be flying back to Colombia, Lord willing, and a lot of Christmas offerings will pay our way to go back, we'll buy our airline tickets to go back to Colombia. And our house and our food, and when we get back in February, our little girl's going to start kindergarten. A lot of Christmas offerings will go to her education. So we're very grateful to you all. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your support because you're sending us out as your own sent out to the nations to preach the gospel there. And we're grateful to be so well supported. I want to end with a little story from Matthew 26. This is of all these scriptures I've shared today have been scriptures the Lord used in my life personally in the past three years on this uh, term on the mission field. So this uh, story comes from Matthew 26 where a lady, uh, Jesus was reclining at table, eating in Simon the Leper's house. Uh, just soon he would be crucified on the cross. And he just foretold about his death again that soon he would be crucified on the cross. Well, this lady walks in and she's got a very expensive flask of um, alabaster flask of ointment, very expensive ointment. But she opens up and she pours it on his head. And the disciples are there and they, they become indignant. And they say, Why this waste? The ointment could have been sold for a large sum of money and given to the poor. And Jesus says, Don't trouble the Lord. You see, you'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me with you. By pouring this ointment on my head, she has um, anointed me for burial. And I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached, this story of her will be told as well. You see, when you start learning a new language and you can't really speak, and you can speak like a, like a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and you really think you graduated when you speak like a four-year-old, you know, and you, you just speak, oh, oh, it's rough, and it's a different culture, and it's all this different thing. You're just like, Lord, I think I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my life, my, my knowledge, skills, and abilities overseas among these, among these people. There's, there's a lot more people, a lot more qualified than me, and they do. I'm just wasting my life. And Jesus just has spoken to me time and time again with this story. What you call wasting, or what the world calls wasting, is a beautiful thing. Because he said, what she has done for me is a beautiful thing. Sometimes we look at other, other things we call other people's sacrifice to the Lord of waste. Or we look at our own lives and say, I'm not going to do that. That's just a waste of time or a waste of money or a waste of my efforts or a waste of that or a waste of my life. And Jesus, what's 
done for him, he calls a beautiful thing. So I'm going to encourage you to, do, to be wasteful in four ways, okay? This is our application then. And we'll close, okay? In four ways, I'm going to encourage you to be wasteful. Waste five minutes each day and pray for unreached people groups. Or waste five minutes in your service or in your Sunday school time and pray for unreached people groups. I want you to watch how... Uh, you waste that time. Jesus will call it a beautiful thing, and he'll knit your heart with his heart for the nations as you pray. We've got some prayer rites for unreached peoples, 52 unreached peoples uh, that you can pray for, and it's got some prayer prompts there. Pick one of those guides up on the back table as you leave today for unreached people. Um, I'm going to encourage you to be wasteful in your giving. That sounds really weird, right? We wasteful, because you might call it waste, the world might call it waste. What if... Uh, Brother Joe, this is just a metaphor for Brother Joe, had a boat and it's worth forty thousand dollars, kind of like the year's wage that the uh, flask of went was worth, worth the year's wage. Forty thousand dollar boat, he's taking it, he's gonna sell it, and he's gonna give uh, it to the poor, he's gonna give it to the church or for the mission of God. And I can see his neighbor saying, What a waste, what a waste. But no, it would be your joy. God loves a cheerful giver, and he calls it beautiful. When we do things for him. Or I'm encouraging you to waste uh, some time and go. Waste uh, summer, your vacation for the year, go on a short term mission trip this coming summer. Or waste your afternoon and walk across the street. Or waste your uh, lunch break and invite somebody from your office or your school to go to lunch with you and share a Bible story with them or share your testimony with them. Pray with them. Waste some time and go on mission with the Lord. And then I encourage you in sending, thinking about sending. Some of some of us would think, man, if my child got uh, called to missions, that would be a waste of their life and a waste of their career. Or to use their our careers and leverage our careers for the mission of God, that's a waste. Jesus calls that beautiful. Do something beautiful for the Lord. Teach your children or your grandchildren. I think, as for me, for, for my children, I think, Okay, Paige and Luke, when I ask you what you want to be when you grow up, I'm the first comment to come out of your mouth, I want to be on mission with the Lord in whatever career He leads me to. Like, let that be our, our, our mission statement for our career, that we want to be on mission for God. One of my favorite pastors say, do what you do well for the glory of God and do it someplace strategic for the mission of God. Amen. Let that kind of guide our, our young people and ourselves as well for a um, for what they'll choose to do with their life for the mission of God. Prepare and disciple your children to love the nations like God loves them. To waste their career as a beautiful thing. Thinking of God's mission. And let's grow our, in our children a love for God and His glory and a brokenness for the lost. You see, brothers and sisters, our blessing has a purpose. And it's not for our comfort. But it's for God's glory among the nations. That the peoples would praise Him that they would know of His saving work in Christ. So may our hearts sing in all areas of our lives that the people praise You, O God, that all the people praise You. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for this morning. We've journeyed together in Your Word, Lord, and all the way to Columbia and back, Lord. Oh, may the Ottawa, we was and Kobe's, may they praise You. May they know You as their Creator, God, and know Your Son as their Savior, Father, I pray for this church that you would bless them, that your face would shine on them, and that they would leverage all blessings that you've given them in life for your glory and your saving knowledge in Christ among all peoples, Lord. May they be generous in their giving. May they be wasteful in their praying, Lord. Praying is a beautiful thing to you, and may you knit their hearts with your heart for the nations. Lord, may the peoples praise you. May all the peoples praise you. Glory from us in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This morning, as you next see this, please stop by our booth there, see some things. You can see the white hat that the men wear. Um, on the table back there, we brought back a belt that Oscar himself made and that I, I brought back with us. See that? And then pick up a prayer card uh, for our family. You can join our prayer group on Facebook. It's a private group, so you just search Mike's Family Journey and ask to join the group and say you're from. Uh, Highland Baptist, and then we'll uh, we'll let you in that that group. Or you can sign up on the page outside also for our email updates we send out as a PDF. Several of you get on that and then print them out from your small group so you can share them y'all can pray, waste some time praying. It would be a beautiful thing to pray. Thank you for having us tonight. God bless you.
you have the time to uh, to respond as uh, Andrew suggested. In the world's eyes, it seems like waste, but in the Lord's eyes, it's beautiful. And people want to uh, pray and commit to give to the Lord in one of these ways that He suggested to uh, spend time in prayer, to give, to go, or even to send. Can't help but remember and think of my my in-laws who knew it was hard when they decided to, to go overseas for mission, but then when all five of their children ended up overseas, four of them in missions, they realized just how hard it was to pray God use my children for the glory of God. It's a time to, uh, to commit yourself. If you want to pray with me, I'm more than happy to be up here. And uh, we've got... Uh, We've got a lot of good Christmas moment later, too. No? No? Okay. Well, I'll have to slide in that brief announcement after this uh, response. Let's stand. He's, Jesus says.
up in these mountains are people who haven't even had the chance to hear the name of Jesus, much less the story of Jesus. They know no Christians, or almost no Christians. So God, we pray that not only through Andrew and Leah and their ministry, but through these Cuban couples and through the, the Dominican uh, Republic young lady and, and through others who are coming to faith, the Colombians themselves, Lord, that you would glorify yourself and expand the kingdom of God as these people are on mission to these tribal peoples up in the mountains. Lord, may you draw people to yourself. We look forward to hearing great news from Andrew and Leah and their team that God is blessing their efforts. Lord, help us as we go from this place to leverage our blessings, rich and abundant and overflowing blessings, to be on mission for the glory of God. As we leave this place, we pray this for your kingdom and in